Thank you very much. It seems uh, the stage is becoming very comfortable. About six weeks ago, I got the, uh, had the opportunity to introduce about eight of the presenters at uh, TEDx, uh, so it's uh, very exciting. Um, as I was walking up here this morning and I saw all the activity out on the street and I thought back about TEDx and all the events and all the process and all the things that have been happening uh, in this community, I said to myself, wow. I said, right here, right now, isn't this the most incredible place to be in the world? I mean, come on. I mean, it's, it's, it, it really is. I, I sometimes think I'm going to start vibrating uh, all the activity and all the things that are happening. This is really just an incredibly great community. Uh, a week ago, I guess, uh, I got an email and someone asked me if I would, uh, and I'd signed up for this event when I first got the email, and somebody said, would you mind introducing Doug Burgum at this event? And I said, oh, sure, emailed right back. And I got done and I leaned my chair back and I'm saying, I'm gonna introduce Doug Burgum. Uh, everybody in the audience knows him. I'm gonna read his uh, resume or, you know, how, how, how do I do this? So I said, well, maybe I can ask for permission to do a little bit unconventional introduction and uh, tie some thoughts into that process. And so they were kind enough to allow me to, uh, to do that. So if, if you'll bear with me for just a couple minutes. So I guess it starts in Arthur, North Dakota. Uh, and Doug's getting ready to come to the big city to go to college. And uh, you know, I know that he, he has said that he remembers uh, his mom talking quite a bit about Fargo and downtown Fargo and what an incredible place that it was as she was growing up and, and how exciting it was. Uh, when Doug came to college in the 1970s, downtown Fargo didn't quite look like that. Neither did a lot of communities around the country. So, but he came, came to the north side, went to NDSU, and as he went through that process and doing great things at the university and, and making a commitment that he has maintained not only as a student but as an alumni and a benefactor over the years, he took time out and he went and traveled. You know, I'm not real sure, maybe he was trying to tilt some windmills or something, but uh, they shared this picture with me as he's hitchhiking uh, uh, up to Alaska. Well, I don't know Doug that well, but the hat is a little, well, no. Uh, <laughs> so would you pick him up? <laughs> but it was a time that that transition was going on and, and, and foundations were being made and searches were being made and questions were being answered. And when his NDSU days were gone, done, there was a calling, you know, like uh, all good men, come to the West. Come to the, 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 the mecca of technology. And he did. Um, but he came back. He came back to start a software development firm that everybody in this room knows about, knows the, the history and knows what happens. But as that company kept growing and they needed a, a bigger opportunity to, to house all of their employees, you know, this is when that uh, strategic thinker, the person that really is looking at things maybe outside of the box, looked to, to South Fargo and, and, and imagined that there could be a facility that was beautiful and, and in the Plains mentality that where he grew up in Arthur. And, and uh, lo and behold, we have, uh, the Great Plains facility in, in South Fargo, and now it's the third largest campus in Microsoft, one of the largest corporations in the world, and, and we're blessed. But it's that insight and, and, and looking at something, and how many people, I don't know, I've only been here for a year and a half, so these are new, new things for me. Uh, how many businesses were on the other side of I-94 when that was built? What's it look like now? It's dynamic. It's, it's incredible, but that's what you need. You need that, that foresight. You need that being able to look and see that not everybody else sees. So Microsoft comes, 
He has a couple dollars, puts it in his pocket. He doesn't leave. He stays here in Fargo. And he heads back east, downtown, to the core, to that memory in his mind of his mom. Talking about how great Fargo was. That's pretty cool. It's always there. It's the process. And when you come to the core, what does that mean? It is the core. It's the foundation. For any community, if you look around those strong cities and the strong municipalities that are across the country, small, large, medium, whatever, they have dynamic cores. It, it gives strength to the people who live here. It tells people that are outside that there's something special going on here. We are in a transformation. We are in a process that is going to define this region for generations to come. And it's leadership and insightful leadership and process and a dream and a voice in the back that will make it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Doug Burke. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mike. And thank all of you for uh, being here today. What an exciting day. I'm uh, glad that all of you were able to make it down here through the, uh, uh, through the ESPN work. I want to just turn the house lights up for a second and a couple people I want to thank. Uh, like uh, Jim said, things are uh, vibrating here. But we got a couple of people that made some exciting stuff happen. So I want to thank, uh, uh, I know he's in the audience, Dean Bershani, president of NDSU, and Mayor Wallacher. Thank you guys both for getting ESPN to Fargo. Didn't know that was still up. We can move on from that. Uh, by the way, I like that hat, Jim. I did, I did like that. Uh, so uh, the thank you, uh, as Mike said, I want to reiterate that, not only thanking all the people that made Loretta possible, but I want to thank all of you that are here today uh, because if you are, if you're here today, uh, you deserve not just a thank you, but also a congratulations. Because if you're here, you're part of this active community that's engaging in thinking about how do we apply design thinking? How do we think about creating a better place to live? How do we think about a better place to build businesses? How do we think about a better place for our children? How do we think about a better place for ourselves to, to, to be successful as a community in a highly competitive world? Uh, we begin today with a lot of gratitude. My, you know, my uh, gratitude is, uh, is one of the things that really drives uh, my thinking. But if you start big, I mean, the first thing we can be grateful is that we're living on, on planet Earth. This is a, uh, a place that's uh, actually uh, hospitable to human life. So that's a, a good thing for starters. Not every place in the universe is. So if you were born here, that's a good thing. You weren't <laughs> fried instantly upon uh, stepping out of the world. But within that, we've got this, the world that we're in. Uh, in spite of what you might uh, hear, uh, right now there's a lot of reason for great optimism on the planet because the planet right now is moving forward at a rate that it hasn't ever in its history. And in the last 20 years, nearly a billion people have risen out of poverty. Uh, this has happened because of the mechanisms of, of free markets, innovation, uh, technology, uh, communication, a lot of things that are, that are ca causing good ideas to spread quickly. And, and, the, and through that outreach and through that evolution, evolution of markets, uh, the world is really a rapidly evolving place uh, for the better. And we have a, a lot of gratitude about, uh, about being in North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota is a place that's also blessed. Uh, there was a time in my lifetime where people thought that, that North Dakota was a um, sort of a godforsaken location and who would want to live there. I think that showed up in the numbers in the year 2000. We were the only state out of all 50 states that had a lower population in 1930. So we were, we were those of us that, uh, those of you that were here and those that, that were hanging in there through all that time lived through some lean years, but through a combination of the, uh, again, the, uh, uh, the bestowed gifts uh, that we have from our land, uh, the, the soil itself, the energy below it, the water, but most specifically the people uh, that are here uh, have helped you know, turn this into an amazing, uh, an amazing place, and so right now we are 
you know, finding ourselves an economic engine that is the envy of the world with really, as a location, some of the lowest unemployment on the planet uh, and, and some of the strongest economy and the strongest growth. And it's from this platform of gratitude and this platform of success, we have to change our mindset to think about, uh, you know, how do we live in a world where we have abundance as opposed to in a world where we've got scarcity. And that, that mindset allows us to dream bigger and think of bigger things and, and really, really create some amazing uh, elements. So in terms of the Kilbourne Group, uh, we think of ourselves and, and our vision is to be a catalyst for inspiration and action for vibrant downtown uh, communities. And there's these two words, you know, inspiration and action. Uh, one is the inspiration is we want to do projects that inspire others to reach higher and do great things. We want to, as just a citizen, uh, we want to, and as taxpayers, we want to have a point of view about, about design and we have, we have a point of view as all citizens have the right to in the great democracy that we live in, have a point of view about how civic dollars uh, could, could and should be spent. Uh, and so we enjoy having that, but we also like the action part. We don't just want to be a think tank or a source of opinions, we want to be a do tank. And so then we do projects, uh, including uh, multi-use and infill and historic renovation and new construction and stuff that, that involves collaboration with a number of, a number of nonprofit organizations because we want to do all those things because doing stuff is fun, but it also then adds back to the cycle of inspiration for others. And as we do those projects, we do them with respect for the past, gratitude for the present, and inspiration for the future with one goal in mind. And that goal is to create unique space and spaces, spaces in between and spaces that are in them, and unique experiences in downtown Fargo. That's what we, that's what we want to do. That's what as an organization we're trying to do. And you might say, okay, well, that's cool. But why does, it, why does a vibrant downtown matter other than it's just cool and, hey, it's a fun place to go? Well, again, we, have, we, we operate the Kilburn Group from two lenses. One is from an economic lens and the other is from a design lens. And I want to spend a minute on the economic side, which is uh, the importance of having a vibrant downtown core uh, is because it turns out that the, a vibrant downtown core is key to having an economically competitive uh, metro area. And if you're going to say, you know, okay, what does that mean in terms of economically competitive? Well, in a, in a world where the economy is running strong, in a world today where we have, it's my understanding uh, that there are 6,000 job openings in Cass and Clay County. This is a number that uh, we share along with all of the job openings across North Dakota uh, with a great sense of pride because, hey, look at the demand for jobs. We have all these jobs, people should move here. But it turns out that if we have 6,000 job openings in Cass and Clay County that are unfilled, that means that we are missing our, an opportunity as a broad community, as a metro area, to, to, to operate at our full potential. Think if there were 6,000 more people here today who had moved here and were filling those jobs and were buying homes and running apartments and going out to dinner and having their kids involved in schools and doing all that, you know, that again, that's a, a, like another almost mid-sized North Dakota city that we would have just in terms of job openings right here. So it turns out if you want to be economically competitive as a city, then the thing that you have to do is you have to attract and retain talented people. And in our discussions, and I know this from personal experience, whether it was at Great Plains or Microsoft, or talking to the executives at Sanford or Essentia, or at NDSU, uh, where they're trying to recruit professors, Sanford and Essentia recruiting doctors, uh, small startup companies that Arthur Ventures is involved with, where we're trying to recruit software engineers to come work here. Everybody is saying, hey, it's a challenge because of the tight economy to find the great people. We want to attract and retain people. If we get a good candidate, and they're, they're not from this market, they're someone that's moving to this market, we want to get them excited, not just about the job, we want to get them excited about living here in this community with their family. And so guess what those organizations do when they're trying to recruit someone? I'll give you a multiple choice. A, do they take them out to dinner at Applebee's and drive them around near the mall? Or B, do they take them out downtown to a, one of the fine restaurants down here and go look at the vibrant downtown community we have? Raise your hand if you think it's A. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think it's B. Uh, it turns out, and this is, you know, again, it's fabulous that we've got one of the best malls in the country. It's fabulous that we're a community that's of a size where we can attract, attract big market, uh, big box retailers like Costco and others and the employment they bring and the low cost goods they bring. It's because, but those are the tickets to play for a community our size. That is not a point of differentiation for us to have big box retailers and have 
you know, suburban uh, tract homes because every community has those. The way you differentiate yourself and the way a city wins is that you have something that is unique and special to your community. And it turns out that virtually every community from the size of New York City down to cities smaller than Fargo, the way cities differentiate themselves is not on the homogenous uh, uh, edge, which is where we've got franchises which span, our again, our entire great country. It's people differentiate themselves at the core. And so, and again, this is not, and I, I want to say this is a Fargo metro thing. This is for Cass and Clay County. It's for our whole region because we all benefit when people move here. It doesn't matter where they live, what they do. We all benefit. So both sides of the river benefit when we've got a strong downtown. A couple cases in point, you might go, well, whose website is this? They're advertising Fargo Moorhead. They're showing a downtown Fargo restaurant. They're showing young people having fun. This, of course, would be the, the, uh, one of the, the homepage of uh, Concordia College recruiting, talking about the fact that we, there's 30,000 college students uh, in our metro area, and wouldn't this be a great place to go to college? Then we've got the, you know, the Dragons uh, uh, page here. And again, in the, the lower right hand, or lower left hand part of that, again, you see a, a click on a link. There's downtown, picture a cruising night. Uh, again, the universities are selling not just an education, they're selling this would be a great place to live and this is a great college town and that's what we need is the influx of young people that are coming here uh, and staying. And of course, uh, this, this week, how timely, the forum asked the question uh, on Tuesday, you know, defined by downtown. And I, I have a penchant for writing long letters to the editor. I thought about writing a very short one this week that would just have one word. Uh, <laughs> and, because as we've just stated, it again, the, the, it turns out, given the, the nature of how cities have been created in America and given the nature of the proliferation of successful franchises, which we all seek and support, the, the only area left for differentiation is in the downtown cores. This is where people are, 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 are defining. And it turns out the younger generation that's growing up today, that's coming out of college, the people that were born, um, again, whether you call them the millennials or Generation Y, the people born between 1981 and 2000, that group of people that are a key part of the workforce today and entering into the workforce, those folks are not dreaming. They're not only not dreaming about your father's Oldsmobile, they're not dreaming about a, a, you know, a three-car garage in the suburbs with a house attached. They're, they're, they're into uh, collaborative consumption, which means they want to rent, they want to share things, they want to share automobiles, they want to share bikes. They're interested in about being connected uh, electronically as opposed to being separated in, the, in, in some ways, the more dispersed suburban uh, ecology that, that evolved during uh, the groups of the people that were my age. And so there's a, a futurist that talks about this generation. They said they're not looking for the dream home. That was the American dream. Uh, the, the next generation is looking for the dream neighborhood. So we want to talk a little bit about what are those elements that make a dream uh, a neighborhood and, and why is this important to, to economic success and growth today. The first thing is let's talk about, you know, demographics.
is on our side and we want to ride that wave better than others.